Why don't we uh, go to the Lord in prayer and uh, just welcome the Holy Spirit. We say that to you tonight, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. We welcome you. Our dependency is upon you, not upon any human wisdom or the ability to teach or preach or any of that nonsense. We renounce that. Our dependency is upon you, Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we address you. We come before you and we bow before you. All that we are, body, soul, and spirit. Father, do what only you can do. The work that only you can do within us. From the opening of our ears and our eyes, the removing of veils, the removing of confusion, the removing of false teaching or false doctrines or whatever may be false that is hindering me from really seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, remove it. Make it perfectly clear, Father, that it is life in your Son that you have given to us and the distinction between that and life in the soul. We welcome your correction, Father, Welcome your rebuke. Welcome your leading, your guidance, your voice. We welcome you, Father, to be unto us all that is needed. Not just right now, but every day. Establish within us, Father, the kingdom of your beloved Son in its fullness, in its vastness, in its greatness. Establish your Son's kingdom in us. Let your will be done. We say this to you, Father, not our will in any realm, not in our praying, not in our preaching, not in our teaching, not in our hearing, not in our seeing, not in any realm, not our will. Your will be done, Father. We do not rely upon anything of our self-life, but upon you. It is by your Spirit, not by might nor power. So we bless you, Father. We know that you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, we know that you answer. So we keep our, our prayers very pointed, Father. Not our will. Yours be done. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, the importance of the soul and spirit distinction, as I've talked about, is not just in the sense of knowing uh, our soul life versus our life in Christ. Is that of greatest importance? Well, yes and no. It is if we're only interested in ourselves, which is a part of our soul life. <laughs> Just thought I'd make that point. But if we're interested in the whole of the body of Christ and God's people in the last days, whatever that means to you, then we understand the great test that is in the self life and in the soul life at the end by the prophecies of the Apostle Paul directly hitting this issue, as I've said, and by the directness of Revelation 18 concerning the, the bartering or purchasing of men's souls, which may seem a little bit random and obscure, but it isn't. 
when we look at the entire picture of what Satan is after in the soul and what he's working unto. So we began with uh, talking about Adam, uh, and let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 here and look at a passage. Adam before the fall. Adam before the fall, and we discussed some, and we were in that discussion as we were talking about the distinction between Adam's soul life or his being a living soul versus us now. So in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, then the Lord God breathed or formed, excuse me, formed man of the dust. This is his body, of course. And breathed, God breathed into his nostrils. Notice that. Uh, it, the Hebrew word there means nose. can mean face, but primarily it's used of the nose. He breathed the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, there's a lot of discussion because of how the Hebrews saw only soul and spirit as one, and the human body as separate, versus the Greeks, let's say it that way, who uh, saw, you know, the tripart man. But let me say this, we're going to need the New Testament revelation of Christ to interpret the Old Testament. That's always true. There's a principle that God operates off of, and this is a God principle. Uh, everything has a beginning, and that beginning is a seed form. It does not, you will not see its fullness until its final revelation, not in its initial revelation. That's true. It's true in this. It's true in everything. So Christ has to become the overlay, not just the New Testament. Yes, the New Testament, but Christ himself has to become the overlay to understanding. This is why we can be very clear that uh, really what's being seen here in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, does not differ, differ from 1 Thessalonians 5.23, because Greek or Hebrew does not matter to the Holy Spirit. He's pointing out what is true and dealing with what is absolute. So we know here that, well, let's say it this way. First, God formed the body. He breathed spirit, his own, into man. There's a distinction between all the rest of creation. And man becomes a living soul. So it's the three parts of man. Man's life, however, here's the point, is in his soul. The spirit and the body meet in man, in man's soul. Life, I'm, I'm reiterating, I know I'm, I'm saying it in a number of ways, but it's important. Man's life was in his soul. That's important we understand that truth because when Jesus in, in Luke chapter 9 says, unless you deny your life. He's talking about this, Genesis 2, 7. Unless you deny your soul life. See what I'm saying? He's emphatically clear. The soul life is not what we're to live by. We're to live by the life of another, Christ living in us. Therein, though, is the great battle and the great need for distinction. As we know in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, there is a distinction of soul and spirit. And God can make it. And we need it to be made. Isn't that right? They can divide soul and spirit. And we need that distinction. We need that distinctiveness. But Christ is emphatically clear in his rebuke and correction that we're to deny the soul life. And isn't that the great battle? That doesn't mean, as a Christian, our soul is destroyed, anything but. We only wish that were true. Well, actually, we don't, because the soul has a purpose, as I've said. And uh, God would not have created it if it did not have an eternal purpose, as does the body, but not the body remaining in this form. We're going to have a new body. <clears throat> so... We understand then God's not going to destroy the soul because he has purpose for the soul or it had not been created. He has purpose for the body or it would not have been created. But God all along, however, saying this, we get this clearly from the New Testament 
in the teaching particularly of the apostles and prophets of whom the mystery of God was revealed, not to the Old Testament writers, that mystery being Christ. Isn't that right? Isn't that what Paul says? This mystery was not made known in times past, which has now been made known to the apostles and prophets. So uh, the primary purpose of prophets then is the making known of the mystery. Not giving words. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's the problem the church is in. We have no foundation. The mystery has become a mystery again. Future telling is not the primary purpose of the prophet or prophetess. The revealing of the mystery of Christ is. And it's the revealing of the mystery of Christ that is so lacking in the church. And thus no foundation. God's people don't have a foundation of life because Christ is the life of the believer. I'm just pointing this out as we're moving through this. So God's people not having a foundation of life, what does that mean? That means their soul life is very active. That's what that means. And you can pray in your soul. And it happens regularly in this body. Is that two-pointed? Because you're not going to like this teaching where it's going. Because God aims to disrupt us. Because we're way over in the soul and in our emotions. Sorry to tell you that, but it's absolutely true. We're living in our soul primarily and can't discern the dis- distinction. That's why I waited so long before doing this series because I know it's going to make people mad. <laughs> we're going to need to be flexible, and we're going to need to be adjustable. And what we so strongly think is the Lord many times is not. It's our soul. That's not meant to make us go hide in a corner. It's it's meant to make us to press into the Lord and ask him, help me. And not think, well, this is, I'll just Jesus and that's all. No, no, guys, you need what I'm saying to you. And so do I. And being confused isn't going to help us. Playing dumb in this isn't going to help us. We need God to adjust us if we're going to press forward. Because we can't tell the difference between emotions right now and the Holy Spirit. That's true of the body of Christ. So we're a dead sucker for the soul and what's coming at the end. Well, anyway, isn't that straightforward? Well, I didn't say that last week, but I did this week <laughs> or week before last. I'm, I'm just being honest with us. The life of the soul is extraordinarily active in the church of Jesus Christ and only going to become more active. Self-life is there. And we drag our emotions even into our prayer life, into our preaching, into our teaching. We drag the soul over into it because we can do it. <clears throat> we get into modes and we think, when I do this, God's in it. When, as soon as you figure that formula out, you're in your soul. I'm telling you, warn you. It's true in preaching, it's true in teaching, it's true in everything. Much of what's going on from the pulpit is solical. Most of what's being taught, what's being preached is of the soul. People like things are delivered a certain way, that's the soul. They like this vessel the way they say it better, that's the soul. I'm not kidding you. We think it's how it's said. It's not. It's the Holy Spirit. And so this is really difficult. That's why we need the distinction. We're all called, called out of it. We're neck deep in it. Make no, make no mistake about this. We're neck deep in it. That's why God's been pressing some of us, pressing me, some of you. Talk about the soul and the spirit. Well, here it is. <laughs> it's going to be difficult. But... Do not, do not get in a ditch of condemnation in this. Let me tell you what to do, like what I have to do, because I'm no different. Be adjustable. Be flexible. Instead of resisting because it's butting up against, and I get all confused, and it's butting up against something I'm doing that I really think is the Lord, be adjustable and be flexible. Otherwise, you won't see the Lord advance. 
and progress. You'll just stay locked in your mode. My mode. Just other than condemnation, rather than condemnation, which is never the Lord, say this to the Lord. Lord, I can hear what you're saying, even though it stings me, my soul. <laughs> but Lord, nevertheless, I yield. Don't get into a pity party. Don't get into introspection. Don't get into self-condemnation. You not only can be condemned by the enemy, you can do a better job condemning yourself than the enemy can. Is that not true? That's the power of the soul. We don't understand the life of the soul, so that's why I'm bringing it up. We blame everything either on the enemy or God. I'm telling you, you have a life called soul life that has great power. <laughs> that's my purpose in talking about Adam's powerful soul life. So, you know, with that understanding, then don't get into the ditch. Repent. Ask the Lord to help and move forward. God's not going to drag you into a ditch of condemnation and beat on you for a while. That's not how he works. What he's going to do is simply say, yes, this is that. Let's deal with it and let him deal with it and keep moving forward with it. Is that helpful? So I'm telling you guys, condemnation will be all over us if we're not careful. We'll get into introspection. We'll get into this. Deal with it like you do anything when you fail the Lord. Go to him. Say, and let's say it this way. Repent. Say what you need to say to others as well. And move forward. Don't make light. I'm not saying being frivolous. I'm saying deal with it and trust the Lord that he, he's a God of his word. If he says, I'll forgive you. You can take that to the bank. He will. <laughs> if you're sincere, he's going to forgive you, and he's going to help us. And if he's not, we're all sunk anyway, and we'll have a meeting. This is worthless. Don't you think? All right, so <clears throat> man's soul then is what we're talking about before the fall. A little bit we've been talking about this. And I made some statements. You probably think it's an exaggeration, but I'm telling you it isn't. Man before the fall, Adam, I'm, I'm interchanging in the Hebrew the name Adam means man. And uh, God called Adam and his wife man or Adam. So there's an interplay going on in the Hebrew over this. I'm just bringing this out. We'll talk more about this the next time we come together. My point is not to get so much into the Hebrew words, though know that we're going to get into them. I've been saying this all along because, you know, I'm getting emails and all kinds of stuff going on. There, I know there's questions and there's going to be some for some confusion, but this is at the beginning. And if we'll stay the course, I think most of our questions will be answered and most of our confusion will be removed. But, you know, if we just stay, think, well, I'm just confused, but stay the course. I've been trying to say that to us, haven't I? I don't understand. Stay the course. You know, trust the Lord more than your emotions, your soul. That he'll bring clarity, because he will. That is his desire. So, and uh, <clears throat> when, we, when we come closer to the end of things, there'll be much more full picture of the realm of the soul. At least that's my prayer. With the Holy Spirit's help, because we need it, I need it, with God's help in this, that will be the case. I'm saying some things tonight which are a precursor of what's coming because we're going to spend whole times talking about the soul in prayer. Whole times talking about the soul in preaching, the soul in teaching, the soul in prophesying, the soul in miracles. And the church doesn't even think that's possible. And we're wrong, dead wrong. There is power in soul life. Miracle working power. And it isn't coming from God. That's the problem. Source is the issue, not the fact of it. So that's why we talked about Adam and his, you know, what, the, what God said to Adam, which seems, would seem almost um, impossible to us now, such as here in Genesis. We've, we've looked at these passages, but we'll need to look again God's command, and I want maybe, Holly, some of this to go back to the amplified version in some of this. And God's command to Adam 
to have dominion. Dominion. Now, notice something. That's man before he falls. God never commands fallen man to have dominion. You catch that? His command was to unfallen man. Who was one, I'm telling you, one million times more powerful than what we are. We think that's an exaggeration. Never grew tired, ever. Incapable was never in his language. The life that was in his soul was not supernatural. It was a gift from God to him. His soul was extraordinarily powerful with the capacity to have dominion over the entire earth. And to, as you guys know, to tend, to guard the garden that God planted. God planted the garden, but his job was to tend it. His job was to guard it. He had the capacity to do so. Anybody ever checked out how big that garden was? From here to the Gulf. Got a clue now? Was not small. 350, 400 miles in one direction. Yeah, you can just rough, that's a rough figure because you have to measure it by the rivers. That's how we know. The four rivers encapsulated. Now, it's hard to do so now because of the flood. The flood changed the Fertile Crescent, the Mesopotamia area. But even by modern standards, looking at those four rivers that encapsulated the garden, you're looking at 350, 400 miles in length. But you don't grow tired. And how far can an untired man walk? Good question, isn't it? <laughs> how much work can an untired man who doesn't get tired do? So, you know, that's talking about his physical prowess and uh, his physical strength. And Adam had it going on. God had given him great physical capacity in his soul life. So again, his spirit is in unbroken place with the Lord. That's the key. His body, not corrupt. His life, his living soul that he is, has what we would call, but it isn't, we'd call it supernatural power, but it's simply natural for the man. You know, I've said this, and we'll reference this more and more. It's this life that Satan was after. Because the potential of that life was greater than a cherubim's. More potent, more far-reaching, more powerful. We all know this for a fact. What God promised man is not promised to any other creation. Cherubim, like any angel... And I'm not saying they're an angel, but I'm just saying this. Cherubim, seraphim, angels, all have a limited view scope of potential. Not true of man. His call is to reign with Christ. Satan inhabits people because he upgrades by inhabiting. Demons possess people not because... They just want to possess. They possess with purpose. They, they possess because of the potential of that person greater than themselves. You would never possess something unless it's an upgrade. Ever. So Satan saw quickly. He heard and he saw. He heard what God said. He saw man's ability in that life of the soul. And his, notice this, he did not overpower the woman. He did not have the power to overpower her. He could only deceive her. He did not have the power to overpower Adam. 
He's after that life, and therein is what he goes for, that life. He attacks the soul, life. And it's his jurisdiction now. Hear me carefully. His jurisdiction now in man lies in the soul. Can you hear what I'm saying? What does he possess? The soul. It's his jurisdiction. He won the battle. Now God, I've talked about this in the fall, God then begins, he stops calling man a living soul. And this is all over the Bible. Romans 8, that's New Testament. Um, Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are obvious. What's the flesh? You're talking about this physical stuff? Not in that passage. Some passages are talking about man's physical body, but not in this. The flesh becomes what man is called, such as all flesh is, is uh, you know, the grass weathers, the flower fades, the Word of God. Well, the flesh mentioned there is this combination now of man's body and his soul, those two together, his spirit dead to God. God calls him flesh. Had to understand now, this is terrible what I'm about to tell you. The diminished soul of man coupled to the human body, which is deteriorating, makes man, this is an overstatement, but catch my drift, much like the animal. Self-motivated around itself. Tell me that's not where animals live. Of course, people think they're going to be in heaven. We're just utterly stupid. That's what I got to say about that. <laughs> Flesh and blood ain't inheriting the kingdom of God. Your dog's not going to be there. Crapping all over heaven. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> there will be animals in the earth, but not in heaven. And I don't care who said it. That's a bunch of crap. They are soul life, not spirit. Man's become much like them, operating off of that drive for what they want. You know that about your dog, your cat. What are they after? What's more important than you? Food. <laughs> Why? Because they're driven by their passion. Is that not right? They're not created in the image of God. I'm not talking about physical now. I'm talking about morally. You ever seen a dog pray to God? You ever heard him? You ever seen him write poetry? You ever seen him write a book? You ever seen him read a book? Why? Because they're a low-level creature. <laughs> yeah, cross-eyed. No, but I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to root out some stuff. Whatever you think about that, feel free. But don't come to me and talk about your dog in heaven. <laughs> Please don't. Because I'm telling you what I think about it. If you're going to talk about animals on the earth, I'm in agreement with that. But it ain't your foregone dogs that died years ago. It's that there's going to continue to be animal life on this planet. And I think a lot of the people who are seeing animals are seeing that on the earth, not heaven, by the way. If it's true revelation, a lot of it is solical. I'm telling you that. A lot of it is the soul. It's not revelation. It's the soul. Visions and dreams. Because there's the real thing from God, and then there's the soul of it. Anyway, we'll go into more of that as we progress. But understand, the soul is life. And it's that life that's forbidden. If you love that life, you'll lose. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Luke chapter 9. Those who lose that life will find true life, Christ being that. See, his remarks are specific. They're not general. They're dealing with this issue of the soul life versus life in the spirit. Man's destiny, we know this from the New Testament, is life in the spirit, Christ our life not the elevated soul life. So what we don't want to look at, and we look at Adam's 
physical prowess or we look at his brain power where he could name every animal intelligently. I'm saying he could read and understand that animal, understand its capacity, understand what its, its purpose was and name it accordingly as well as all the birds which would fill a dictionary and is there anyone on this earth who has that power to do just that, but that was not stretching his brain power? And we're not dealing with, hear me, we're not dealing with just 100% use of his brain, which he had. That's not the issue. It's soul life. Intelligence in his soul. Not brain matter. It's the gift from God of life. See what I'm saying? That's where his intelligence is coming from. That's why it's absolutely true that man has lost intelligence, not gained it. To gain intelligence now will need to be a spiritual reality of revelation, not the soul. Well, take a deep breath. <laughs> It hits us all. It hits me. Just because I said it don't mean it's not. Listen, you know, I, I've asked the Lord. I continue to ask the Lord. I'll tell you what I'm asking him, to bind my soul. That's what I'm asking. Bind my soul life. Break it. Break its power. We're going to need to be tenacious in this. Don't you think? <laughs> and consistent. Bring me under the hand of the Lord in every arena, body, soul, and spirit. So, you know, just again, just because that, that's the problem with this. This is why I delayed so long in talking about it, because I'm in need of it as much as you are. I'm asking the Lord as much as you are. <laughs> so knowing what we know does, is not the same as the realization This, this understanding without the Spirit, this knowledge without the Spirit isn't going to help me. The realization is Christ living, Him increasing, my life decreasing. Isn't that true? So it's not what we can say in this. It's the life that's being lived. Who's living? Okay, so man's brain, I touched this a little bit. Man's brain power then is, as we can see in his naming of the animals, his naming of the birds, his, cap his capacity in that arena is much, 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 with a few more muches greater than what we presently possess. That is why, by the way, the Egyptian pyramids could be built with such precision that cannot even be replicated today by machinery. So much that they could not, they say you can't slip a piece of paper between the stones. And there's no mortar. It's exact alignment to the north. How is that even possible? Because we think we came from apes. <laughs> we came from the most highly intelligent man who's ever lived until Christ shows up in the form of a man. We come from a man whose brain in his soul life, acted like a computer with instant pull-up, faster than that, who didn't leak. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That's right. And all that just didn't fall off the cart immediately when Adam fell. That's why people get upset at me. I heard from this from people. That's why the word Nephilim, meaning giant, which not just doesn't just mean stature. It refers to more than stature. It's physical size. It can refer to physical size, but that's not the full extent of that Hebrew word. It can mean a great one. Greatness, not just in, si in the sense of his physical stature, but in his capacity and ability. You'll notice there in Genesis 6, the statement that's made, 
Now in those days, both before and after, before and after what? When the sons of God came into the daughters of men. There were giants, Nephilim, in the land before that happened. That's what the Hebrew says. Not just after. Go back and read it. There were giants before the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Just got to see it. Before and after. Anyway, we'll cover that in another time. It's not my point. I, I made some remarks about Adam being a Nephilim, and what I mean by that, he was a great one. Is his physical size larger than us? I believe so. Whether it is or not, it makes no difference. You live 930 years, that's pretty great. <laughs> And by the way, if you look at the spiritual significance of the sequence of those chapters that have no chapters, 4, 5, and 6, you'll understand, as we should understand, the Genesis 6 reference to the great ones are listed in chapter 5. You got a man living to be 969 years old like Methuselah, 950 years old like Noah, Anyway, so uh, let me give you a heads up. <clears throat> By the way, you understand that the bloodline there in Genesis 5 begins with Seth. Cain and Abel are not there. And Cain's entire ungodly line, notice my language, ungodly line is not mentioned in chapter 5. The ungodly, unrighteous line, those who are not the children of God are not mentioned in Genesis 5. Only the children of God are mentioned in Genesis 5. Thus Genesis 6 reference to the sons of God is not an obscure reference. It's referencing chapter 5. The godly line. You don't believe that? Read Luke 3. When that godly line is repeated comes to the finality Adam the son of God. There you go. Every one in chapter 5 are repeated in Luke 3. You're dealing with the godly line, the children of God. You're not dealing with angels. You're dealing with men. And then marrying into the ungodly line that's talked about in chapter 4, Cain's bloodline. And what were they doing, Terry? I'll tell you what they were doing. They were preserving the line, the bloodline of Christ. That's what they were doing. Proof of it's Luke 3 in the bloodline. Anyway, we don't have to go into weird doctrines. Jesus said the angels do not marry or give in marriage. They don't reproduce. Isn't that right? I mean, know that scripture. Angels don't re procreate. They're only created. They don't procreate. They don't have the ability. So demons don't procreate. Anyway, it's the book of Enoch that's the culprit in this. And the book's not true. I can give you references to tell you why it's not true. Such as Enoch. Now here's just one. Such as Enoch talking to Methuselah or to Lamech about his son Noah. When God took Enoch home 69 years before Noah was born. The book is completely wrong. Nobody seems to want to talk about it. Well, now, <laughs> and that, I'm not trying to make this a, a being mean spirited. The Lord told me to do this class and told me to bring this into view for to help us. And I have responsibility for overseeing this body. And believe you me, that's, that's only one point of the book of Enoch. You understand that the Jews threatened to, to excommunicate anyone who believed in that book? 
How many know that? That's how they received it. That the early church had nothing to do with it, despite what you've been told. That only Augustine, Tertullian, and Augustine waffled. And its consideration that the book might be whatever. Did you also know that that book could not have survived the flood? Unless Noah toted it on the boat, of which the Bible is completely silent. Anyway, how far do you want me to go with that? I only about 25 points. Yet we got whole people preaching that book like it's a passage of Scripture. And it's not. It was not canonized. Because it's got angels marrying human women and having babies. And producing giants that are 450 feet tall. Insanity. Insanity. You got to have a bad case of the stupids to believe that. That's the way I look at it. And I know that's not kind. I'm sorry. But I'm just telling you guys. Christians will believe almost anything. And the more wild, the better is when it comes to the charismatic mania. Charismania. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm having to say this. Why don't we just, why don't we just really get back to what the Bible says? And I tell you, Genesis explains itself. That's my point in all this. Genesis is perfectly clear who has the sons of God, who they are. They're the children of God, the godly line. Genesis chapter 4, the last verse, proves what I'm telling you. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord again. And it goes right into chapter 5 and lists those men who are the children of God. And actually the Hebrew translation's not proper there. It actually means that the wording there in Genesis 4, the last verse, actually means they had the name of God. It wasn't just that they called on the name of the Lord. They had the name of God on them. They were the children of God. There's no chapters in there. It's all one continuous thought coming through. Anyway, last time I checked in Genesis 6, 4, what was produced from the sons of God and the ungodly line of Cain was men. Not a dual role or dual element being. These were the mighty men. What mighty men? Genesis 5. The sons of God produce something. Children of God. It would be better translated that way. It's Hebrew meaning. The children of God intermarried with the daughters of men. Anyway, what's going on there is is explained in Genesis 4 with the ungodly line of Cain that's laid out there in Genesis 4. By the way, if you're questioning where the women come from, let me just say something to you. By the time of, of Abel's death, and up to the point where we're talking about them intermarrying, there would have been 32,000 people in the earth. They were marrying they were marrying the descendants of Adam and his wife. Adam Clark in his commentary goes into great detail about the fact I just mentioned to you. That a hundred years distinction was there. And during that time frame there'd have been as many as thirty two thousand people on the earth. You don't have to have weird doctrines to get the answers. God's put it in the book called Beginnings. And if you want to know the beginnings, look in Genesis. You don't need to look any further. Amen. Is that helpful? Hope it is. That wasn't a very good response. (laughs) And if the angels, let's say, if the fallen angels are still intermarrying with women... Or why aren't they intermarrying with women? Maybe is a better question. And what happened after the flood? Because the giants are back. But God wiped them out. It's called genetics. Not demons. And the genetics of Adam was the largeness of men. But we're not talking about 450 feet tall. 
Neither is the Bible. Og's bed was what, 13 and a half feet? Deuteronomy chapter 3? That's what you're talking about. <laughs> Goliath, 9 foot 9. That's what you're talking about. We're not talking about 450 feet. Anyway. And we're still having people large. We're still popping up. I was looking at a woman the other day, she's eight foot ten that's living. Eight foot ten woman. Anybody want to marry her? <laughs> Just to kiss her, you have to get on the ladder. <laughs> She's probably big enough to just pick you up and kiss you, I guess. <laughs> uh, what would that wedding look like? I do. What'd you say down there? <laughs> Back talking to me again? <laughs> I'm sorry. Got to lighten things up. I know this is pretty heavy. <laughs> no, well, folks are still being big. What's that mean? Genetics. It's in the genes. It doesn't take demons to produce big people now. It didn't take demons to produce Nimrod, who's called a Nephilim, a giant. Isn't that right? Where was he descended from? Ham, son of Noah. So in the bloodline of Ham, genetically, was the race. Anyway, all right, just, just want you guys to know something. You can trust the Bible. It is inspired. This other crap, don't give it the time of day. Jesus didn't say anything about there being an extra book. He talked directly about the 39. Never mentioned another book missing. Not another apocryphal book was mentioned. Didn't need to be. They had it right. He put his complete seal three times in the Gospels upon the Bible that they had, the 39 books. All that's written in the Law and the Prophets, that was the twofold category, or the Psalm, the Law and the Prophets, the three, threefold category of the 39 books. So you don't have to worry about that. You got it right. No other apocryphal book was added. It wasn't meant to be added. I've talked about this repeatedly. The candelabra, 39 bud blossoms and blooms on one side, 27 on the other, 66 on it. God was prophesying to us clearly the number of the books of the Bible right in the candelabra. So we got it right. Aren't you thankful? You can trust that the Holy Spirit did it right. We got the books we need. And when the book's not canonized, it's because it's not, un, it's not inspired. We shouldn't be quoting books like they're inspired when they're not. And there's reasons why they weren't inspired and reasons why they weren't canonized, mainly because they weren't inspired. But the main reason is the testimony of Jesus is not in the book because Jesus said all these books point to me. Don't you think? Well, anyway, I'm just saying you can trust your Bible. You can read Genesis and be assured when you're reading through 4, 5, and 6 there that's telling you the whole complete picture. That's telling you who the children of God are versus the ungodly line of Cain that God forced to separation and that Cain took off in a different direction unto separation. Isn't that right? And that there was a godly line that was offering the sacrifices and they were keeping themselves pure from the ungodly line and that they understood Genesis 3.15 the seed is coming, the Messiah and the bloodline of the seed is coming through us read Luke 3 <laughs> proves that point there's a lot more I could say about it but it would get into objective revelation and I'm talking to Enoch and I'm not going to bring that into the picture because the Bible will prove it. <clears throat> but I'm just saying to you this, is you can trust the scriptures here. And when you got something majorly wrong with a book, like the book of Enoch, or something just flat out wrong, such as a conversation between Enoch and Lamech about Noah when Noah's not been born, 
69 years not been born. Don't trust it. Anyway, that's just one thing. So, all right, let's go back now. We we're talking about Adam's brain power. We're, there's this whole thing of thus God given to Adam what would be impossible for us. This management of the garden, this management of the earth. But you guys understand, that's a test for Adam to a greater call. It's preparation. It is um, training for Adam and un understanding that Adam was never meant to stay as good as the soul life was before the fall. That was not God's plan for him fully. That God wanted to give him an entirely different life and that life was going to come from his acceptance of the second man, Christ. Had man, Adam, not fallen, use those words interchangeably in the Hebrew, had man not fallen, Adam without death could have accepted the new life of Christ. And he would have gained that life through his knowing, I'm talking intimacy now, his knowledge of the Lord. It would have been necessary for him to willingly, that's the expression of his soul life's will, submit to the greater will of God and be joined to Christ in life. Which would have elevated him, this is really a low estimate, to billions of times greater than what he was. It's as great as the distinction between God and his creation, of which Adam's a part. God had something so much more powerful, something so much more spiritual, something of life so much greater, his own, to put inside of the man. So thus our injunction in Colossians chapter 3 that we're not to live by a soul life but by the life of another. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ is revealed then you'll be revealed with Him in life. That's what Paul's going after here. He's doing the different life. It's always been this issue then, here's our battle. Our battle on a day-to-day -day basis is going to come down to whether we want to live in soul life or we want to live by the life of another. Isn't that true? And soul life has a power and thus is deadly. Even in its much reduced form, let's call it flesh now, which is more real. But it's the self-life, no matter how you cut it. It is the self-life. It is the flesh life. We can say soul life, but it's coupled with the body. And I want to say this. When man falls and his spirit is dead to God, not annihilated, but dead to God, and certainly not dead to spirits, but dead to God, his soul is joined to his body, and it's his body that has dominion over his soul as though it encapsulates his soul. And man's soul, life, continues to deteriorate. That's why I said what I did about him becoming more like an animal. And man, so look at man's passions. Man's passions become more and more, because I'm telling you, there was a dignity to his soul life before the fall in his honor of God and his respect of God that is completely lost. Why? Because man's flesh, and it's his body that's dominating. It's his needs. You see what I'm saying? And of course, in the church, we got doctrines to teach us that, I'm sorry, but I, called faith doctrines, teach us we should want all of that. Self-denial isn't in any of it. The denial of that life, of flesh, isn't in any of that. I'm just uncovering stuff. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just telling you. 
If you see things at a foundational level, then you'll see it clearly. And you'll see all the doctrines that have come through the church and the mess that it's made of people. And all this stuff that's elevated everything but what God would have us to have. Life in Christ. Christ our life. Living by the life of another. So that life, Christ lives in us and thus Christ is glorified and not me. Not you. That it's not about me getting my way. But it's about Christ being rightly represented. Isn't that right? Yeah. That God gets seen. Not me. And that there's a greater testimony than God met my needs. Though I'm thankful. There's a greater testimony of Jesus than just that. Than a God who meets our needs. God who is life. And his nature is lamb. Who wins by sacrifice. By denial of his own self. That's God's life. Not the spoiled, rotten, bratty, I'm sorry, American form of the gospel we presently have. And if we're done with that nonsense, we can become what God meant for us to be. An altar where the lamb is offered back to the world. He needs to be seen and he needs to be represented. And he's not going to be as long as my eyes are on what my needs are. As long as my soul life, my flesh life is dominating. Let's say it that way. Wouldn't you agree? I'm, not, I'm just hitting it. So, so Adam, before the fall, there's something beautiful there. It's not in absoluteness of what God wants yet. But it has the potential to get there. After the fall, man's dead. His spirit is dead to God. He's fleshly. He's living from the passions of his own body from his own flesh. He's living for that, wanting that, craving that, working towards that, yet still having, because of the soul, still having the power to say no to soulish things. You understand? God's comment then to Cain, you must master this. What? Your soul. Don't give the excuse the devil made me do it. You still have the power to master your soul in the sense of not giving in to it. We got something greater than that, though. Surrender to the Lord. God our help. God our strength. But I'm saying the unbeliever has the power to say no to their soul. Look, Cain, murder is wanting to get on you here. You know what's going on? Nobody ever been murdered before. Murder's wanting to get on you. You must master this. Sin is crouching right at your door here. Say no to it. You guys know, you guys understand this truth. We don't have to give in before we came to the Lord. We don't have to give in to everything. There are some things we didn't give in to. Isn't that true? Why didn't we? Wasn't the Lord. It was our choice. We can say, well, the Lord was protecting me. No, you didn't want it. I'm just saying. There was life in the soul. And you can choose what you want to give yourself to. That doesn't mean you're not by nature a sinner. You are spiritually. But nevertheless, you still got a choice. You still have a will in your soul. Does that make sense? It may sound confusion, but it's true. And we've lived it. You didn't give yourself to homosexuality because you didn't want to. Let me be really clear with you. You didn't give yourself to these things because you didn't want it before you knew the Lord. That's the will of man in his soul. If you want the will of God, you're going to have to come spirit to spirit with him. So there's power in the soul, is my point. Still. Still there. It's still there. Soul's not annihilated, thank God. Still has purpose. It's meant to be sanctified, completely submitted to God, and never be our life again. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 23, sanctifies body, soul, and spirit to God. Not annihilated, sanctified. Completely submitted to God. It means the whole person, the whole man under the hand of God. Life is in the spirit, Romans 8. Notice there in Romans 8 the distinction of flesh and spirit life. Our life is meant to be in the spirit, Christ in us the Spirit of God in us, and the Father in us, the entire Godhead. Isn't that right? John 14, the Father and I will come and live inside of you. Father's in you. You might not want to talk to him because nobody can talk to the Father. Well, he's in you. You might want to think differently about that thought. (laughs) I'm sorry. I can't help myself tonight. I hear all these doctrines, and it's coming. I'm sorry, it's coming out of ignorance. The Father's living in you if Christ is in you. And the Holy Spirit's in you. God's desire was to be the life in us, to dwell inside of us. So uh, the Father's in you. He's not some stoic being up there don't want to have anything to do with you. The Father and I are going to come and make our abode, our house, right inside of you. That's what Jesus said about it. Thank God. The Father's living in us. When we pray to our Father, we don't have to shout. Somewhere out there. He's in here. (laughs) Loudness won't matter if he's in here. I'm not saying you can't get excited. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, though, what I'm trying to do is take away the distance. The Lord's in you. His Father's in you. And the Spirit's in you. There's no distance in that. It's spiritual. It's spiritual life. So it's beautiful, isn't it? See, so man has a call to something way beyond. Thus man now, see the beauty of this. Let's, let's switch gears for a second. Man now has the potential of God in him. Satan's lure was if you eat this, you'll become like God. God's plan was to become like him. you find this about the cherubim, that cherub that Lucifer was. Because he was created with a very specific parameter, the face of a man, the face of the lion, the face of the eagle, the face of the ox, that his work is going to be centered around what he was created to do, only in evil rather than now before God in function. It's a very small, very limited capacity. You guys know what the scripture says when it comes to the end. Is this the one who caused all the trouble? That that, that thing... <laughs> I'm not minimalizing him right now, marginalizing him. Does he have spiritual power and authority? Yes, much of it what we give to him because it's it's conquering our soul. And as long as we are living in our soul life, even as a believer, we're allied to him. (laughs) That's my point. You can be praying and praying witchcraft prayers right out of your soul, thinking it's the Holy Spirit because I got the emotion. It has nothing to do with emotion. This is the burden. The burden's not an emotion. I'm not saying it won't make it emotional. I'm saying it's not an emotion. Or preaching. Or teaching. And I'm doing this and I'm saying, but, but something's missing. What's missing? The source. And I can kick into a mode of preaching and kick into a mode of teaching because it's something I can do. And I can do it when I read the scripture. Do you see how vast this is? And what we're faced with, and what we got to get really before the Lord over, and be adjustable, it's huge. We've not seen it in its vastness. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure most of you are like me. I know when people are praying witchcraft prayers. I'm talking about solical prayers. I feel it, and it ain't good. And then you have real witches who are operating in their soul with demons. (laughs) And you've got Satanists and uh, their schemes and their plans and their curses. And they're praying against believers. One thing we don't need is our souls praying. Wouldn't you agree? Let me give you a really guarded way of saying this. Be careful that you think you know the will of God. 
The scriptures are emphatically clear. We don't know how to pray as we should. It would behoove us to go right to the Father and ask for His will for people and not ours. How's that for a way of praying? Do we need rewired by it? I believe we do. We need to ask the Father, your will be done. Now you can make that into, let's say it this way. Say you're praying for someone's marriage. Father, your will be done in their marriage. I don't need to put in there all the things I think need to happen. That's witchcraft praying. Can you hear what I'm saying? It is. It's come right out of the soul. And if we'll go there, it will ring true to us that the Father will give us understanding. But I'm telling you, first it's going to be the people. Jesus was not kidding when he taught the disciples how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. He wasn't kidding. I've been asking the Lord, teach me to pray. and Teach me to get out of my soul. Again, emotion is fine if God's the source of all this. But emotion is not if our soul is. I'm simply saying to you, the emotions are neither here nor there, though. That's not proof of the anointing. Not proof of purpose. And not proof that it's God. Well, that went down like a rat sandwich. (laughs) I'm just trying to... Where's the plumb line in this? Approaching the Father and not telling God what to do. He knows what to do, I figure. And I found incredible peace in praying His will for people. And I keep my mind out of it. And you guys know how hard this is, especially if it's hitting your own family. It's easy when it's on your own family to think I know what needs to be done. The truth is I don't. I don't even know how God wants to do it. So why not just pray the Father's will? And you think, well, that'll be quick. You're wrong. The more I go into that of the Father's will, the prayer goes on the ground, and I mean it goes on and on and on. But you got to go there. It is. Because the Father will guide us. God the Father will direct us. He is our Father. So I want to put the positive in there, not just a negative. If God's striking at a negative, be encouraged by what I'm about to tell you. If God's striking at a negative in any arena, and there's multiples, I'm only using a few tonight, we're going to go down a path that's going to basically take us down everything we're doing. But the, but the purpose is not negative. It's positive that we can get onto God's ground. And isn't that what we're after? Isn't that right, Gary? Somewhere down the line, guys, this is what's in our hearts, isn't it? Get onto God's ground in this, on every arena. You guys know if he's going to have a priesthood, they're going to have to be on God's ground if they're praying. And we've been asking to be a priesthood. Do you see the correlation? Of, well, now the Holy Spirit's dealing with us. So you want to be a priesthood? Let me talk to you about your praying. Let me talk to you about what you're offering up. Because it ain't my will. It's yours. Let me talk to you about worship being something you do and not what you are in dedication. Can you see what he's doing? He's dealing with the priesthood. The priests were worshiping the Lord. It didn't have anything to do with music. The priests were praising the Lord, including music. None of it was before an audience. It was only to the Lord. You understand what I'm trying to get at? We're doing it before people. They never did. They did it only before God, in the enclosement of the tabernacle, alone there before the Father. We got a better plan. I don't think so. And that wasn't even the way God wanted it, because he wanted it here. The Father seeking true worshipers, and that wasn't it. The tabernacle David wasn't it. That's John 4. He's seeking worshipers, not worship. He's seeking a people who praise from here. Because if it's not here, it's not of of God. It's not of His Spirit. You see what I'm saying? 
We got to be worked up into it. That's the soul manipulating your emotions. Well, take a deep breath. I could go on and on with this. I'm telling you it's what's going on in the church. We're manipulating people's emotions by music. That doesn't make music evil. I'm telling you we're in our soul. We shouldn't need manipulation to be a praiser of God. It should come from within. That's what God's after, and that's what I'm arguing for, and that's what I'm getting creamed by people out there, and I don't care. I'm just letting you know what's going on because these old things die hard. God's after something that's internal. The kingdom's within, and he's after it. He's after worshipers. The Father is seeking true worshipers. He never had it in the Old Testament, ever. That's his comments about Jerusalem. Neither in Jerusalem or in this mountain. See what's going on? I'm not being mean. But that's the journey God's... God, what are we praying for to be a priesthood? God's answering our prayer. How's he answering our prayer? By disrupting us. We brought the fire down on ourselves by our own praying. Jehovah Sneaky strikes again. Tricked us into praying the right prayer. Pray this prayer see what happens. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'll discombobulate you. What you think you know, you're wrong, Terry. I remember him and, and him resisting me in one of our times together. So you think you can draw people into worship, huh? Ask me that question directly. You think you can get them to praise me, do you? You think you can get them to me, do you? I think not. That's what he said. All I could say was, yes, sir. <laughs> Over and out. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> no, I didn't even go that far. Quietness was bliss. I'm trying not to think. The only thing I was thinking of was where to duck. <laughs> I'm playing around. <laughs> God wants a priesthood, and that priesthood is here. Or it's nothing. It's of the Spirit this time, not of bloodlines. Isn't that right? Yeah. It comes from the Spirit being in us, the Holy One. And we become something. What? A praiser. A people of praise. We become. See, there's the distinction the church wants to do. God's after being. And we don't know how to be. We only know how to do. We do prayer. We do worship. We do praise. Aren't y'all glad y'all came tonight? <laughs> See, what the being is the is issue. Being. God's into being. It's a verb. Well, it strikes at the heart of this. God allows man to continue in life in his soul all he'll ever have is a doing that's not internal of the Spirit. Adam must renounce and reject at some point, even life being a living soul versus Christ's life in him. He would have given up his life had he fallen or not in order for an upgrade called Christ in you. Well, we're not faced now with anything really different than a denial of our soul life. Have you done that? Have I done that? Let me ask you. Don't raise your hand. Have you really intentionally and specifically gone before God your Father? Let me be real clear. God your Father. And ask your Heavenly Father to help you to fully renounce your soul life. Have I done it? Have I renounced my judgments, everything of my life in the soul. Concerning God, concerning what He wants, concerning what I think He wants. And have I let the Lord Himself become my life? And am I okay with not knowing, but trusting my Father? Am I okay with remaining forever adjustable and not getting entrenched 
to the point that God has to dynamite me out of things. Am I okay with that? For staying flexible before the Holy Spirit as pertains to what I don't know and understanding that without Him I can do nothing. And even more than that, without Him I would refuse to do anything. I refuse to live in my soul. I refuse to judge by my soul. I refuse to go down that path of ministry in the soul, including the Old Testament forms of it, which was all soulish. It would not come onto spiritual ground until Christ came into a people. Isn't that right? And then, my friends, God has something He wants that's in His image, that's in His likeness, that's coming out of life, and it's coming from the inward out. And what does that mean to the church that's so bent on the outward trying to get stuff into people? When it's by a spirit. Isn't that right, Dan? It is by the Spirit. We know that. But let's connect the dots for a second. What does by my Spirit say? Well, it's not by your soul power. Not by might nor by power. It's not by your soul's might, your soul's power. That's Adam's life. That's the rejected life. That's the life we must deny. We must renounce. It's by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, yeah. You know, and I know that uh, it's what's easy here. Let me say it this way. What has been so natural for us has been that natural life. And we can make God an add-on. Isn't that right, Chris? We can make him an add-on to, and it becomes religion. And he's no longer the source. And we're just adding it on to us, and you know, well, I'll add in his... Uh, Speaking in tongues, and I'll add in, I'm sorry, but I'll add in on this prophesying. And here's the funny thing we got to understand. The soul has the capacity to do it. That's the whole meaning of Jesus. You're going to come to me on that day, and you're going to say, did not we prophesy in your name? Did we not work miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And I'm telling you, it's by the power of the soul. That's what he's talking about. I never knew you. See the danger? He said, that's impossible. Jesus didn't think so. Well, isn't it supernatural? No. Can demons be involved? Yes. But I'm telling you, the realm of Satan is the soul. That's what he's after. He's not after the demonized realm. He already has it. He's after the soul. The Antichrist is the Antichrist because of his soul power, not because of simply his demonization. The false prophet is the false prophet because of his soul power, not because of his demonization. Is the demonization there? But this demonization is not as powerful as the soul. That's what we don't get. It's an upgrade for those demons. That's why they seek a house. Man has the potential greater than them. They knew that. It's us who seem to have forgot something here. Adam had the power, even in soul life, to guard the garden and keep the serpent out. To deal with that serpent. I mean, who's he guarding the garden from? It's just him and his wife. We don't go down that path. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Wipe your feet or get out of the garden. <laughs> That's a 300 mile walk. <laughs> Throwing dishes at you the entire time. I mean, you gotta have a strong arm to lob one 300 miles. <laughs> You're not out yet. <laughs> your couple runneth over after it hits you on your head <laughs> sorry see my terrible sense of humor <laughs> well anyway so <clears throat> so then the beauty 
of what we're being offered is surpasses everything Adam ever possessed. We're not going back. We're coming up. <laughs> we're not going back to a garden. We're coming into Christ. And Christ is coming into us. Isn't that great? We're not going to a power of soul living that Adam possessed that was so fantastic and so beautiful. We're not even covering all. But read, the, read Genesis with, with eyes on the Holy Spirit and ask him to show you and understand that we don't have the capacity to do what Adam did. It's not in us. But also understand this. We're being offered something so much greater than that. Christ our life. We're being offered God to dwell in us. God to express himself through us. That means limitless power of God. Here in the final days, I've been saying this, but I'll say it again. Here in the final days, Satan's been after this all along. That's why parapsychology and other such things, that became religions actually. Started out science trying to disprove this power, only to discover it, its realness. And many of them started believing, just so you can study it. Take time to study it. They started believing in the power of the soul because they got healed. Genuine healings. Just wasn't the Lord. Mesmer. Will we get the word mesmerized? I mean, no. Got to study it. See what's going on. See what went on. When they began to unlock, how did they do it? Get this. Through self-denial. That's why I made the comments about solical self-denial not being God's way. This is a self-denial life, but it must be the motivation of the Spirit, not my soul. We have to be clear on that because of what I'm talking about in parapsychology. I don't know, I'm going to cover, I'm just saying. Some of us have known other religions. Some of us have known what they do in those religions, such as Hinduism, such as Taoism, such as other religions. And not just that, then you have Mary Baxter Eddy, and the Church of Christ science and other forms of what became religious out of this uh, parapsychology. And they unleashed something. They, what did they unleash? They unleashed through denial the soul. Some of them are li still living to great lengths of time. And I don't get into all the reports. I'm just telling you. People being healed. Again, but it's not God. It's the soul unleashed. People say, well, that can only be through satanic power. That's how little we know about the soul. See the danger then at the end? Paul's prophecy in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, the self-life. And his lists of what's going to go on, coupled with the truth of Revelation and other passages of Scripture. Say, what is Satan doing through these sciences and through parapsychology and through these religions? He's trying to get the soul out of the grave of the flesh and bring it back out. That's what he's doing. He is going to accomplish a measure of it enough for the empowerment of his Antichrist and of the false prophet, who, as you know, are going to call down fire from heaven. And perform signs and wonders. They're false, but not in the fact of its happening. In its source is false. See the difference? They're lying wonders, but they're real. But they're not God. That's, that's Thessalonians. It's Christ talking about it as well. You won't believe me, but another's coming in his own name. Him you'll believe. Another man. See the face of the cherub. A man. What's he going to recreate in the end? What he has in cycles throughout human history. But there's a finality to it. There's a final man that Satan's going to introduce. It's his man. And it's his man on the threshold, let's say it this way, of the end. And that man will have the potential 
of the soul unleashed. Not just demonization. Believe me when I say this to you. I wish it was only demonization that we can deal with more better than ever before. It isn't. It's something much, much worse. The soul. One of my good friends who I talk about, one of my pastor friends who had direct dealings with Anton LaVey, and uh, I won't go into all of it, but, uh, you know, because of Anton LaVey possessing what would have been called one of his daughters who had gotten away from all that and the pastor friend was uh, trying to help her in their house and Anton would come in and possess her like a demon. And Dave, without knowing, would say, you know, come out of her. And Anton would use the girl to punch him right in the mouth. I'm not a demon, preacher boy. You can't cast me out. You understand where I'm coming from? Something much, much worse. But we can't see it. The purpose of this message is not just God dealing with our souls. It's preparing us for what we're about to face. It's already in the church. The soul is rising in the church. The power of the soul is rising in the church. Miracles, prophecies are already occurring, and it's so power in the church. It's a real question, friends. I'm going to say something here. It's a real question we need to ask. I know way too many people who grew up in the church who've never been born again, and they have gifts. You understand what I'm saying? They have gifts, and they've never been born again. And they were, by the church, put out on public display because of their gifts. Think this through for a second. Let me just go there with you a second, okay? I'm not trying to be critical. I'm, I, if anything, I'm trying to say we really need our Father to break in. These people I'm talking about need help, God's help. But they got to first going to have to want it going to have to see it. So they grow up in the church. And I don't know about you guys. There's something healthy in what I'm about to tell you. I got delivered from a lifestyle. I know what darkness is. I am not confused. But they're confused. And so they grow up in the church having never been born again. And they got these spiritual gifts operating in them. But the character sucks I'm not kidding you. And you know why it sucks? Because they've not been born again. And they don't know how to distinguish the darkness of soul life from God's life. That's what's going on. And so to them, they're preaching a gospel that, oh yeah, transvestite, da 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 da, that's okay. When it's not okay. You'll never convince me that my lifestyle of darkness was okay when God convicted me in true deep repentance and I passed from death to life. And it was radical and it needs to be because you can't encounter the living God and it not be radical. You see what I'm getting at? I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to expose something for the purpose of prayer and for the purpose, if anyone within the sound of my voice can hear what I'm trying to get at. This is on our watch, friends. And it ain't just on our watch. It was on past watches. People of God who I personally knew, who I believe were never born again, that had major roles in the body of Christ in their generation, and yet struggled their entire life with a lifestyle of darkness. It's because they were never born again. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have struggles. I'm saying something was wrong. And they played cover-up all their life. But because they had a gift, and their gift was incredibly accurate, because the soul can be incredibly accurate. This is one of the discoveries in parapsychology, was telepathy, clairvoyance. 
It hooks you. Well, I know people who have that in their soul when they're a child. Me being one of them. It was there from when I was a child in clairvoyance. And it was not from the Spirit. I know how that works. I know how to read people's thoughts in my soul. How to listen in. And I think just because I'm born again, now it's the Spirit when it isn't. I'm being really open. I've said things I've never told anybody. It was from the time I was a child. When I got born again, something different started happening. As it should. And they have to come to a dead reckoning after a while. I will not. I will deny that life. I will deny it. I will deny its clairvoyance. I will deny, it, deny its telepathy. I will deny that. All of that, by the way, as you guys know, is a cheap substitute for what's real. But it's real. All that is a counterfeit. But you have to be spiritual to discern it. Because it looks the same, acts the same. The source is what's different. And we're going to have to know the Lord well enough. I warn us. We're going to have to know the Lord well enough to where goosebumps isn't the proof. Because you can get goosebumps in your soul from movies. Have nothing to do with the Lord. From songs. Has nothing to do with the Lord. I know that's the Lord. Look at the goosebumps on my arm. Get a life. <laughs> Gods. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm just being honest with you. Come on, guys. That don't prove anything other than the fact you got goosebumps. And they're still working. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. That's how deception comes into the body of Christ, when we can't discern what's real and what's of God. Isn't that true? Because we think, well, it can't be real miracles if God's not behind it, can it? Yes. Can't be a real wonder and a sign. Yes. What's not real about it is its source. It's not God. There are people being healed right now in these arenas. You know that, brother. Richard knows it. Others have been in these arenas. Understand what I'm talking about, the reality of what I'm talking about, the power of the soul. The church got it all confused and think it's only spiritual power when it's not because they see the miracles. Well, it's got to be God. See, the basis is wrong that it's got to be God because it's real. And that's what I want to undo. No defining of the absoluteness of Christ or the cross of Christ. And so you can live your life the way you want to. This is so true of so many things. You can live the life you want to and still have power. Isn't that what Satan offered the woman? You can be like God without him. Isn't that what he offered? He saw the potential of the soul life. And, it, and it's, it, you say, well, is it not coupled with demonization? Oh, yeah. But I'm, what I'm saying to you, there's more power in the soul than there is in the demon. I'm not kidding you. Demons don't want to come into something that hinders them. They come to into something that's greater than them. Satan was after something greater than himself. Man. Man's got all the promises. Not a cherub. Man's going to rule and reign with Christ, not a cherub. See the small boundaries of the cherubim versus the massive promises to man, but only in Christ. But the false kingdom is man being like God without God. And by the way, the parapsychologists in some of these teachings will say that. You're actually a God, but your godness is entrapped in your body. They say that plainly. And they say, well, we'll show you, get this, exercises to release your godness. That's the power of the soul. You say, ain't that a demon? No. It's you. <laughs> With your soul unlocked. God hid it in your body because of very real reasons. Satan's trying to unlock it. Let me go back to another statement. 
Anton LaVey made to my friend. Late night conversations. Because <laughs> uh, Anton said directly to him, if you Christians were as committed as we are, you'd be moving in the power we are. That's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? I'm just trying to not make us afraid. I hope you're not coming into fear. Because that's not of God. That's just of our soul. <laughs> but I am trying to say this to us. And this. I'm trying to alarm us and alert us as to what's approaching. If we're going to talk about the end, we're going to have to talk about the prophecies of the Apostle Paul particularly and of others. And we're going to have to deal with Thessalonians. Isn't that right? We're going to have to deal with Timothy in the book there that Paul says all these things about the last days. As well as then what's said in the book of Revelation about Babylon. And we're, we're and, and I mean this in a spiritual sense now, believe me, Babylon is coming. Again. It's not the first time. It may be the last. And I've talked about this enough for you guys to know what I've been saying about it. Babylon in all areas. Babel. Nimrod, whom the Satanists and the witches love so much. And say are his coming again. He is, but not him. Someone greater than him. Satan's man. As the cherub introduces the face, a man. In three areas, I've talked about it. In government, kingship, isn't that right? In voice, the eagle, and in a priesthood. And we already see the priesthood. It's speaking loud and clear in this nation, threatening governors. Isn't it? If you don't give in to the transgender agenda, we're going to pull our business out of your state. Or we're not going to have a football game there in Georgia. We're not NFL speaking. Hollywood speaking. PayPal speaking. Can you see the formation of a priesthood? What is their priesthood? We're watching it. Satan's introducing this priesthood. Led by, I might add, Someone the world seems to really be adoring and think, oh, the Spirit, the, they call it the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm talking about the false prophet. I'm talking about the Pope. That's who he is. Anyway, that's the time we're living in, guys. This isn't now anymore off in the future. It is among us and upon us. And the church is unprepared. And the great falling away is over this issue of soul life. Did you hear that clearly? The deception of it. 1 Thessalonians tells us this. Paul's very clear. 1 and 2 Thessalonians, perfectly clear over this. God is going to send a deluding spirit upon those who did not love the truth so that they may be, I'm sorry to have to say this to you, so that they may be destroyed. God's not playing around. They did not love the truth. They resisted him. So he's going to give them what they want. He's going to send a deluding spirit. So they'll be eternally condemned. We don't think God acts that way. We really need to get a clue. There are consequences, but nobody wants to think so. So anyway, this again, I'm saying, saying to us, and I'm going to have to stop here, but uh, this is upon us. This is in our time. We are seeing it. Not in its full blownness, I agree with you. But it seems like every week. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, uh, almost every week. Something else is on the agenda that's unbelievable, unbelievable, especially in the nation we've been living in. You know, and darkness is taking incredible strides. And where in the world are the people of God? 
Our voice has been silenced. Much the reason because it's the soul voice. And if we're going to speak, it nearly needs to be the voice from the throne. Don't you think? Well, anyway, so for our children's sake and our grandchildren and for one another, for the families of the people of God, for the household of faith, that's why this teaching is coming out. People are going to hear this and get upset because I'm calling some things out. I'm saying very clearly, you can be moving in accurate prophetic gifting and it be the soul and God nowhere in it. That you can have, hear me, you can have a spirit, a human spirit now, not just a demonic spirit, a human spirit acting in a level of clairvoyance and telepathy and be deceived and think that it's the operation of the Holy Spirit. You guys know there's real psychics, real ones, who can read your mail. How many know that? Say, well, it's a demon. No, it's their soul. I'm going to tell you something. Adam read the animals. There was no language barrier. Didn't exist. He could communicate with them and they with him. We don't understand what we're dealing with. Well, and by the way, the Lord can do that too. Certainly did through St. Francis of Assisi when he confronted the wolf. Talked directly to it. I did it with my, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did it with Bubba. <laughs> yeah, our swan. Told him directly, either you and I become friends or I'm going to kill you. How you like that? <laughs> There's an ultimatum. <laughs> I can't have you going around attacking kids. We became friends. Took a little doing, but we became friends. <laughs> In fact, one of the things the Lord told me, he said he don't even know what a friend is. He's never had one. So, anyway, I probably shouldn't have told you all that. <laughs> it ain't the first time I've been in that scenario with things. Or you can talk to storms. I've talked directly to tornadoes. I've watched them divert. Been in one as it circled all around me. Even the, and this is the power of the Holy Spirit, though, is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the human spirit now. But I'm doing a distinction for a second. When the Lord's come upon me and told me, speak to the tornado and divert its course. I'm thinking to myself, on to who? <laughs> <laughs> Look out, Mike, here it comes. <laughs> You're in fat, run for cover. <laughs> I have to think, you know, it's like move them out. Doesn't always happen. I'm just telling you, it's happened five times in my life where I've had to confront tornadoes. Would stand out in the middle of the night sometimes as well as in the day. Get up in the middle of the night and go outside because the Lord said do it. Not a good thought. It's raining like cats and dogs. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I, I'm simply saying, again, here's my point. We can see what's there in the soul. There's something billions of times. You're dealing with the distinction of the created versus God. God in us is what God was after with Adam. What we have now is God in us. Can he trust us? Becomes key to this. Because if our soul's still active and we crave power, and we crave the making of a name for ourselves. That's still our soul. And we're craving to be seen instead of Christ being seen. And there's not much going to be happening. And people, listen, people, this is closing. I close at nine. People crave that power. And when they've tasted solical power, it's a hard thing to give up. Read the book of Acts. That's why Paul gets in the face of the guy. 
He's been being used in the power of his soul. He wants to buy the Holy Spirit so he can continue in a form of fame and name that he had. And uh, Paul ain't having nothing to do with that. Calls a curse right on to him. Isn't that right? Well, I'm going to say something to you. People sometimes get used by the Lord. And then because of soulful stuff mostly, the Lord lifts like he did off of Samson. But they still crave it. And the soul is available. And for the church, having seen this in their past, now can't discern this in their soul. It is going on as I speak. Proof of this is how little the cross of Christ is in the body of Christ right now and in much of the signs and wonders movement. Because the Christ of the cross of Christ deals with the power of our soul. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20. It is a cutting away permanently, putting away of that life, a renouncement and a rejection. I will not live in the power of that. I will not let its power be expressed through me. I will never turn to that. God may never, let's say it this way, who cares though? God may never flow through me in that way again. And if that's my test, Lord, let me pass it. He may flow that way through somebody else. You know what I'm saying, Mark? Am I okay with that? Is my relationship with him secure enough to where he, not ministry, does it for me? I don't need to be in front of people. Do me a favor and get me out from in the face of people. I'm not kidding. I came out of the hidden life. I was forced into the public. I did not want it, nor did I seek it. Neither did Elijah. Because public ministry is your doom. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Look at Elijah. When he's running, he's running back to the private from whence he came. And once God puts you into that public arena, if he keeps you in it, and it's curse. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard, but I'm just being honest with you. Your life isn't your own anyway, but I'm telling you, in that arena... You gotta be you gotta have a case of the stupids to want it. The more public the figure you are, the more problems you're going to have. And the more problems you're gonna face, and the more opinions you're gonna face. <clears throat> anyway, and it just comes with that territory. So be thankful if God has you in the place of just being before him. I envy you. I do. That once was all that there was. I'll take that every day. <laughs> it's true. Still have that with him. Don't enjoy the public. I don't. Well, that's just way too telltale, isn't it? I'm being honest with you. That's how I feel about it. Because you guys know this. It's not what we are up here. It's what, we're, what we are in private before the Lord that matters. Who are we before Jesus? That's what really matters. And that's the question you need to ask a leader. You love the ministry or you love the Lord? One of my good friends recently came out with that. He had a mistress called ministry. Took something. I so appreciate him sharing what he shared. That his mistress was ministry. Most people will never go there. Well, anyway, such is the power of the soul and the lure of the soul. Such is the lure of ministry in general. Something wonderful is ministry that's just before the Lord and to the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? 
The priesthood of the Old Testament was mainly built around that issue. Their ministry was to Him. No one watching, no one seeing but one another. Their ministry was to Him. There in the confines of the tabernacle, especially the inner court area, covered with skin, they ministered to the Lord. And that wasn't what God wanted in fullness. He wanted that in here. They were going through the motions. I'm telling you that's what's going on. That's why John 4 is so telltale. They're going through the motions of something that they didn't possess here. They were doing something. But it wasn't here. And now we have it again. We have that. And I don't need to tell you, you already know, all the prophecies about the return of David's tabernacle. We're prophesying our own damnation. We're prophesying what God didn't want. We're prophesying our own condemnation, our own confrontation with God himself. I want this in you. And why do ministries, why do movements go the way of the dodo? Because of what I'm telling you. Because we stop moving. And we build around something that's being done. And we build around a way God's doing something. And God moves on down the line to image, to the internal. And he's not interested in having gold teeth. (laughs) As much as he's interested in you having a gold heart. Valuing the things of God. That this not meant to these things become after a while monuments of a past movement. Is that not true? Because we stopped moving and God didn't. And God goes on. He starts there to get somebody's attention. That's really what's going on. He starts there to get somebody's attention. Having gotten our attention, his desire is to go inward. And, and he's moving with us as he did Israel because we're pretty much in the same place in our soul. So he's doing outward phenomenon to try to get inwardly to us. So miracles and signs and wonders are meant to alert us to him. They can't transform us. They're meant to get us on our knees, to get our attention. And man, don't misunderstand me. I appreciate everything God does. And he does it. It's not like he stops doing it. But what he's really after is a people in union, a people in intimacy, a people who know him, a people who want him, a people who have the kingdom of God within them, life of Christ here. And so he's moving forward in that movement towards that goal. The cross has to be introduced into the movement to begin to cut away the outward to get at the inward. And therein comes the great trap because the hype And the emotion and the soul of it is built around those things. And when God starts restraining, people start leaving. Tell me that's not what's happened. Isn't that what's happened? It's not meant to be negative. It's meant to have proper discernment. Because God has nothing unless he has it here. And has no one. He wants worshipers. Not what we're doing. That's what he told me directly. I'm interested in making you people into something that you're not. And you're never going to get there like this. That's the cold hard facts of what he said. If he doesn't have it here, he doesn't have it. If it's not coming from within, it's not God. Well, guys, I'm sure this will be your last soul and spirit meeting. (laughs) I'm playing. (laughs) I understand this was a shot across the bow warning you about coming things so that you won't want to come. (laughs) You won't want to show up. I'm playing.
I know you better than that. I think. <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? We're caught. We're neck deep in something. Don't you want out? I do. I want God to get his way finally. In me. In me. I want to become. This thing's about being. Being. Let's pray. Let's put our hands on our hearts. I, I don't know. I feel in my own heart. Just the dealing, as I've been feeling, the dealing of the Holy Spirit. And wanting to show me something that I'm times unwilling to see about myself. I guess the question comes to me. Will I hear? Can I hear? Will I be adjustable? Will I be flexible? Lord, with new meaning, sanctify us fully, body, soul, and spirit. I pray that Hebrews 4.12, this dividing of soul and spirit, God continue to have at it with me, with us. Continue to bind my, our soul and our soul life. Bind it, Father. Father, we ask you to bind it. Father, we ask you to break, break the power of our soul life. Whatever measurement, Father, of it is still in me in all these various areas. areas. I renounce it. I do not want that life. I choose the life of your son. I choose Christ to be my life. Christ, the new and living way. Not Adam. Not soul life. In every arena, prayer, preaching, teaching, Every arena, publicly, corporately, privately. Holy Spirit, we simply say that the Father's will be done. The Father's will. That I can be corrected and instructed, rebuked if necessary as has been the case so many times in my life. It will be the case so many more times. But I thank you, Lord, for your rebukes. I thank you, Lord, that you do want a priesthood. But that priesthood is not like the Old Testament. It is of an entirely other than order, a spiritual one. It is within first. And that there's no natural bloodline. And that it's not firstly doing, but being. And that the hold back to that priesthood is that fact that the being is sorely lacking. May no condemnation rest upon us. I pray that right now, Father. No condemnation. Whatever conviction you're doing, Holy Spirit, that causes us to run to our Father, yes and amen. But no condemnation. 
no pit, no ditch of condemnation. No self-condemnation, no condemnation from the enemy. Correct us, Lord. Instruct us, Lord. Rebuke us, Lord. Whatever is necessary. Deliver us, Lord. But we go on with you. We refuse to live in a ditch. We refuse to be moaners. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> we refuse to stay in a ditch complaining. An introspective ditch. We refuse to go there, Father. We keep our eyes upon you. Fix our eyes upon Jesus. You're the author. You're the perfecter in this. And that's our prayer. Your will be done, Father, in us. Your will be accomplished. Your will in the subjugating of our soul. Your will in our soul being brought under your hand. And it's sanctification being real and true. Your will and life in the spirit versus the flesh. Your will, Father, never drawing from soulish life. We renounce Soulish power. Renounce it. Just, you don't have to say it out loud. Just say it in your, in your heart. Well, I renounce soulish power. I renounce clairvoyance of the soul. I renounce telepathy of the soul. I renounce miracles and healings and the power of the soul. I renounce it. I renounce dreams and visions of the soul. But Lord, we receive all that is real from you. You as the source. We love your voice. We love it when you communicate with us in all the ways that you do it. And Lord, may by the restriction of our own will and our own soul, Father, may you trust us enough to take us in your trust and release an abundance of life. And all the realms of that Christ life, ever increasing, ever increasing, Christ is our life. No small thing. That Lord, it's the greatness of who you are would so overshadow the smallness of the soul life. We ask for that, Father. Guide us through deliverance, Father. Remove fear. It's not from you. May your love cast it out of us. Every fear but the fear of the Lord. We ask, Father, that your Son would be glorified in us that he would be testified to by the life that's living in us and being seen in the name of Jesus we ask for that we would be living epistles of Christ read of all men in the name of Jesus Amen